Is it working? Let's find out. How is everybody doing? Is there anybody out there? Hi, Internet. How are you guys doing? <laughs> it's working. It's not Thor. It's Pastor Goodman. Hooray. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll wait just a minute for everybody to kind of get started. Good afternoon, hi. Uh, we get to pick up today with Genesis chapter 19. Yeah, thanks Pastor Borghart uh, for stopping right here at uh, this uh, not at all tumultuous chapter. So uh, Genesis chapter 19, um, Sodom and Gomorrah, higher things crew, what's up? We know how this one goes, but at the same time, um, it's not one we actually tend to spend a lot of time with, uh, past joking that uh, God destroyed Sodom and then connecting it with, well, the sin of sodomy. Uh, we, we tend to sort of go right past that. There's some kind of beeping. Does anybody else hear that? I'm going to keep talking until somebody tells me otherwise. So uh, we, we get Sodom and Gomorrah this day. Um, now, if you remember, uh, yeah, of course he's standing. He doesn't sit. Uh, things go, my, my brain doesn't actually work when I sit down. I, I have to stand, otherwise it doesn't work. Um, so when we when we deal with, with uh, Sodom, we have now, remember, Abraham just made this, uh, this, this deal with the Lord uh, that, that if there were only uh, uh, ten righteous in, in the whole city, uh, it, it would be spared. When when, um, when we deal with this, uh, we, we have a, a God who, who has promised to spare the city if there were only ten righteous within it, um, but then while the angels go into Sodom, uh, we, we know that they are, um, they are brought into Lot's house as gas that the men and boys of the city uh, surround the house uh, to, to attack it. Um, they, they are struck blind and the angels warn Lot and his family that they are to flee to the hills. Uh, Lot will eventually settle on the city of Zoar uh, with the angels as a place for them to, to flee to, to, to go, to live, to, to stay. Uh, Sodom is destroyed. And and then, um, if that wasn't weird enough, the end of the chapter is actually where all of the uh, the weird stuff starts happening. Uh, Lot's wife looks back and is turned to salt. Um, Lot does not go to Zoar, uh, but instead he camps out in the hills with his daughters, and then um, something icky happens. So we're going to just sort of dive right in tonight. Uh, yeah, we are working with a, a uh, my, my brain um, on ADHD. Uh, this is a mind map, and it helps me uh, because I'm bad at sort of picking one thing and sticking with it, and so I can jump all over the place as uh, whenever I want to. Uh, but we are, are working inside of Genesis chapter 19, which you can see over here. Uh, here we go. So the, the city of Sodom um, is uh, only really known for one thing, and it wasn't even actually the reason that the, the city was destroyed, but that, that one thing has become uh, such a, a hot topic in the last uh, decade or so when it comes to the, the sin of homosexuality that, at best, Christians uh, tend to try and either stay away from it, or we can only really talk about it in, in terms, of, um, in terms of, of what happened and we lose sight of the larger problems going on there. Uh, so when we talk about sin, uh, because this is maybe the, the, the one sort of topic that might be useful to us, uh, sin breaks stuff. Like that, that's why God calls it sin. It's, it's a, a diagnosis, a label for everything that undoes his creation. And Genesis chapter 19 is a textbook 
problem of what happens with sin, both when you stare too hard at it, when you ignore it, when, when you let it take over in your life and it would start to infest other places where you don't want to. Um, over and over again, we have this problem of sin breaking stuff. Uh, and so Sodom is, is warned um, of their, their destruction. Um, we, we know that, and uh, I'm just going to jump right actually all the way down uh, to when the angels warn about what's coming. Um, in, in chapter 15, morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of this city. Uh, when, when we have to deal with, with this, this idea of, of, of punishment, um, we, we ultimately have been warned that this is coming. Uh, we, we've been told that this is, this is not a new thing. Uh, in fact, God told Abraham that the sin was, was going to um, destroy the city. Because, well, sin breaks stuff. And we've got this problem that we try really hard to ignore that fact. Like the reason that God calls it sin is that we would be aware that the wages of sin is death, that the, the path down these things is, is deadly. And so when God talks to us about sin, uh, he does so with the intent that we would not be given over unto the condemnation that it brings. Um, the problem that we have with sin is sort of the problem that we have with everything else that, that goes wrong is that we, we tend to try to bury it. We tend to try to just ignore it and, and hope it'll go away. And, and I've seen this uh, with, with not just sort of our, our vices, with, with, with the problems that we have, but I see this even in terms of, of our, our, our health. Um, we, we, I, I've lost count of how many people who should have gone to the doctor when symptoms started, but they waited a year or two and it ended up being something kind of serious. And if they had only not gone through with this, if, if only they, they'd actually not ignored this sin, then, then all of a sudden um, there was so much that could have been prevented. Ignoring sin won't make it go away. Um, so God calls attention to what's going on at Sodom. And in fact, it's not just sort of that he dropped fire out of the sky on all of these people. Uh, it, it's that uh, he warned them. So first, uh, when we deal with the, the destruction of Sodom, recognize God warned them. He, he warned Abraham over and over again. And then Abraham heard and pled with God for mercy. And God heard. And then God spared all of those who would hear his promise to save. And only after first God warned, and then God was merciful and made promises to save. And then God saved the people that he promised to save. Only then was Sodom actually destroyed. Like walk through the text here and recognize we've already gone through a, a chapter where Abraham bargains with the Lord, uh, begs the Lord to be merciful. Uh, and the Lord hears and actually says, I will be merciful. Then, then the angels are sent to Lot to call him out of the city. You see, we, we sort of act like the angels are sort of a litmus test as to what would happen uh, if there were not righteous people in the city. Like they were sent to go and count the righteous ones. Do you think God didn't already know that? He's, he's God. He, he knows his elect. Uh, my sheep hear my voice and I know them, says the Lord. That was true back then too. Even as Abraham bargained with, with God, do you think God didn't know how many righteous ones were in that city. And we remember righteousness, not according to the law, but according to the gospel. Righteousness by faith. Those who heard God's promises and believed him, those were the righteous ones. God knew who was righteous. The angels were not sent there to count, but to deliver. They were there to, to preach the promise. Get out of this place, you will be safe. Go to where God has set up shelter, and there you will have shelter. Uh, when we talk about what the angels are there to do, they are not there to sort of bring about the downfall of the city. They are there to save the elect from the downfall that is brought upon itself. When we talk about um, the law, we recognize just how painful it can be. Um, we, we recognize just how deadly it, it can be. And so when Abraham is told that the city will be destroyed because of what's going on in Sodom, he knows. He knows no one can be saved if we're going to do this by works. The faithful saw the law's condemnation, but they also knew who their God was. And they looked to him for mercy. This is what Luther would actually point out here too. Uh, he, he wrote, uh, it nearly always happens that those who should be frightened are the most complacent. And those on the other hand, who uh, are in need of comfort, feel anguish and despair. So if we go to the sin that everybody's thinking with sodomy, um, we, we can recognize, well, today's problems. When we see people struggling with the sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. 
uh, especially in light of what's happening in, in Sodom, where, where the men are uh, set upon the angels who present themselves as, as male, the, the, the angels uh, who they want to rape. Well, this was done at night in shame. Today, today uh, we've been told to, to celebrate our sexuality um, in a way that when we actually come to deal with God's law, which destroys, uh, we find it to be a joke. We find it to be something to laugh at. And we're doing that on purpose. It's because we would rather be complacent than afraid. We would rather uh, laugh at a problem to try and diminish it than to actually deal with the threat that there is something greater coming. Uh, rather than simply saying, Sodom is a place where sinners get what they deserve. Instead, look back to all of the promises that God would make throughout this whole entire chapter and the chapter before it and recognize that as God is working to save, over and over again, he's preaching. He's sending messengers. He's speaking to people and promising them shelter from the destruction that sin would bring. Um, if, if we ignore sin completely, we're going to utterly and completely run headlong into the problems, into the destruction that it would bring. Uh, today, our sexuality is our identity. Yeah, that's actually kind of the problem, Jacoby. Like, understand just how deep that goes. Uh, to identify as gay, um, that, that means that the first and, and foremost, the thing that you should know about me is what I want to do with my downstairs. I would hope, even if you have a same-sex attraction, that there is more to your rational soul than simply that, that urge that you have to identify along the lines of your sexuality is to diminish everything else about you and with it the gospel because your identity is baptized your identity is one for whom christ has bled your identity then is a sinner that jesus died for and a sinner redeemed and made holy when we reduce our identity especially to the ones that will celebrate our sin understand how little room there is for hope for the gospel, for life. This is where we really start to, to have a, a problem with, with what goes on. Um, the, the idea that, that um, sodomy is um, such a, a, a disgusting sin, well, it falls in light of the Sixth Commandment. Um, and if it falls in light of the Sixth Commandment, we can talk about it in terms of all of the other ones too. Uh, let, let's talk about it then in terms of pornography. Let's talk about it in terms of living together before marriage. Let, let's talk about it in terms of, of um, divorce. Let's talk about it in terms of all of the ways that, that sin breaks stuff so that as we actually start to deal with what's going on, we can actually start to see there's more going on than simply um, homosexuality. Sin breaks stuff, and it's deeply infectious. Thank you, Borkhardt. I, uh, I, I try to be eloquent with my words. Um, sin is infectious. This is a serious thing that was happening in, in Sodom. Um, in fact, this is one of four sins that um, the saints cry to heaven over. Um, we, we see that um, the blood of Abel cries to the heavens in Genesis 4. The unbridled wantonness of Sodom cries to heaven. Um, in Exodus and Deuteronomy, we see also the abuse of orphans and widows, which doesn't, like, it's not good, but, like, you don't quite see it in terms of how we always want to talk about it with murder and homosexuality because, well, the abuse of orphans and widows happens inside of our walls. Withholding of workers' wages cries to the heavens right up there with the unbridled wantonness of Sodom, right up there with the blood of Abel. The sins that cry to heaven are the sins done in wickedness. And I don't just mean sinful. I, I mean wicked. Uh, wicked is an unbelief term. When, when uh, we, we start to see uh, the, the concern over what's going on, um, there, there's a wickedness. This is a word that, that is um, sin devoid of faith. Uh, what we see in terms of this um, here is um, a people who, who have lost sight of the goodness of the Lord. Because the thing about the church is we're actually really set up to deal with sin, even homosexuality. In the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. No more sin. Sin's all gone. Piece of cake. 
Like this is why Jesus bled on the cross to forgive the sinners. This is why he has established a church to deliver that forgiveness to the world. Uh, the, the joy that, that we have inside of the forgiveness of sins is that it is a free gift. It is given to all. The problem starts to come when, well, we have a, a rejection that we actually need help. Isaiah 3, 9, for the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Uh, when we talk about sin, uh, there's a difference between sin and unbelief. Unbelief is when you actually say, I don't believe this is wrong, or I don't believe this is wrong for me, or I don't believe in a God who would dislike this thing that I like. They proclaim their sin. They are proud of their sin. They have pride. Um, we can make a bigger font. How about this? Ooh. It actually says something about um, the people that, that we deal with today uh, who, who have named an organization Pride. Um, again, we're not saying that uh, people who, who struggle with same-sex attraction can't be saved. What we're saying is if you are proud of your sin instead of repentant of it, the bigger issue than your sin is your unbelief, your wickedness. I'm going to go to Philippians 3.19 while we're hopping along. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. They glory in their shame. Uh, they will not be corrected. Um, the men then um, in, in uh, Genesis 19 who surround uh, Lot's house, uh, they actually take issue that he would dare to correct them um, sinfully. Because Genesis 19 is a messed up chapter. Borghart, what did you leave me with? Um, so... Lot, as he goes out uh, to try and, and save uh, these angels, um, he does this thing that um, he shouldn't have done. <sighs> Lot went out to the man at the entrance. He shut the door after him and he said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not yet known any man, although they are engaged. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Thank you. That's, that's not an okay thing to do. That, that's sin. That did happen. We're not contesting that it happened. But we're allowed to say, that's, that's probably not a, a, a good thing to do there, Lot. Uh, that, that's not helpful. Um, so what, when we talk about what's going on here, sin breaks stuff. And it's infectious. Uh, the Genesis chapter 19 ends with Lot's daughters, well, raping their father. Do you think maybe it's connected to when Lot, uh, well, out of fear, tried to give his daughters over to be raped? See, sin leaps across things uh, long past where we would otherwise have it go. Um, and, and so when we talk about what sin is, uh, we have to recognize that, that we have to be careful uh, that, that we don't lean too far into it because sin breaks stuff, even faith. When we talk about um, Lot's whole disastrous affair after everything starts to fall apart, um, yeah, how do we say that's okay? How do we excuse what, what Lot did for his, his family? Um, like, I, I know that there are, are um, apologists out there that just, they, they want to, in, in um, celebration of, of the faithful, sort of put the best construction on everything. But at the same time, um, sin has to be called sin because it does break stuff. Because when we raise up our children um, in how they're supposed to treat their families, we have to actually try and, well, help them not perpetuate some of these cycles. Um, I want to go all the way over here. Um, back up. See, when we talk about sin, we can, we can ignore it and then watch it sort of spin out of control, like it does for Lot, like it does for his daughters, like it does for those men whose city was destroyed. But the other thing we can do is we can stare just a little bit too hard at sin. 
So as uh, we, we know this story too. As, as Lot is told to flee the city, he takes with him his, uh, his wife and his daughters. Their, their fiancés won't go. They think Lot's crazy. Uh, but they are warned, don't you dare look back. Um, and so in verse 26, Lot's wife did anyway. The sun had risen uh, on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. And Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And again, we, we sort of recognize that this is, this is wild. Like, this is ridiculous. God just blew up an entire city and then turned a girl into salt for looking back at the fireworks. And the best that we can sort of do is figure like, yeah, this is like an action movie. Like, everybody knows from the action movies, when you're walking away from the explosion in slow motion, you don't look back because it makes you look way less cool. And trust me, I know how to look not cool. Um, no, that's not a rock and a hard place. Um, I, I really don't believe it's a rock and a hard place between handing over your daughters to, to rapists um, and um, dealing with the... The, the guest rights, because, uh, um, well, they were already inside. I, I, I just, I, I'm sorry, like, I, I'm not willing to, to sort of go down the road to say, well, you know, sin breaks stuff. And, and we saw Lot um, desperate to fix a situation by his own works. Um, oh, I would have looked back to uh, that. Well, he, he got overwhelmed by the situation. Um, I'm not going to excuse it. I'm not going to do anything other than say he should not have done that thing. Um, what a mess. <laughs> Lot's wife looks back. But here's the thing. I don't think it's just what, whether or not you're allowed to look at the explosion because two verses later you see that Abraham looks too. Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah toward all the land of the valley and he looked and behold the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of furnace. When God warns Lot's wife not to look back. I think it's about more than just sort of don't watch the explosion, don't stare at the sun during an eclipse. I think it's a recognition of everything that Sodom was, especially to Lot's wife. Now remember, when Lot settled in Sodom, it was because that was the rich place. <laughs> Like when, when he left, uh, parted ways with Abraham because they had supposedly too many, um, too many cattle and, and too many servants that they could all actually be together. Lot says, all right, dibs on the place where uh, there's lots of nice things and lots of money. Dibs on the nice place to live. And they knew what Sodom was. They knew that it was an unbelieving city. They knew um, because it had such a reputation before everybody what kind of things were happening there. And they wanted to go there anyway. I actually kind of wonder it, whether or not Lot's wife was looking back in covetousness, even as she knew everything that was going to happen. Because there was prosperity in Sodom. There was the word of God in Zoar. There is, um, there is uh, Sodom is, is a city. Um, Gomorrah along with it. Zoar is one of the little cities that was going to be destroyed with it. But Lot pleads um, to spare Zoar so that he can go and live there. Uh, more on that later. When we talk about Lot's wife, I honestly think she just wanted to go back to a nice, safe life. And the danger of that is that we're willing to ignore a lot of things about uh, which God's word would speak in light of our idols, in light of the nice, happy life that we really want. Uh, and if you want to see it today, just ask 90% of not just unbelievers, but Christians, does God just want you to be happy? A lot of them would say, well, of course God wants me to be happy. See, they were happy in Sodom until the, you know, raining fire from heaven bit. Uh, <laughs> but there's this thing that we, we do with sin, though. Um, sometimes we ignore it and hope it goes away. But sometimes we just stare way too hard at it and we get this sort of object fixation bit, sort of like a kid riding a bike and riding towards a tree and they know that they don't want to ride into the tree but they can't stop looking at the tree and so they're, they're riding and they're trying to steer away from the tree but they can't stop looking at the tree and they, they end up steering into the tree because they can't not look at the tree and yes, this might have happened to me. Um, Christians get awful focused on a few different sins. Have you ever noticed? And that might not be healthy for us either. It's not that we want to ignore them but at the same time, becoming absolutely obsessed with sin as if we we can only somehow 
fix it because this is the one thing that's going to crush the whole wide world. And so really what we need to do is look at this one thing and judge that as um, absolutely awful because also it sort of lets us ignore our sins. Well, maybe the other side of that coin is that maybe we're just living a little bit vicariously through it too. Could it be that Lot's wife lost her faith in the city and she chose dying over following God? That's, that's sort of what I'm saying. Um, that, that as Lot's wife looks back, she's looking away from God's promise to save her in Zoar, to, to take her and, and keep her safe. Like, you know, he has so far every other day that, that they've heard this word. Um, remember how they got to be wealthy in the first place? Remember how they got to be taken care of in the first place? She turned away from God's promise and back towards the ways of the world. Now, Genesis 19 is a really, really concrete chapter for what happens spiritually. It is a prime example uh, um, that, that uh, when we talk about salvation and, and condemnation, when we talk about heaven and hell, when we talk about the resurrection of all flesh, uh, some to uh, everlasting joy and some to everlasting sadness, we're talking about a real thing. When um, Lot's wife turns away from the promise um, because she is so focused on what's going on in Sodom, you can say it was because she just, you know, she, she had to watch the city burn after such a, t a terrifying night where she was hiding in her house with her daughters afraid for her life. Uh, you could say that she just sort of missed um, the, the prosperity that went there and, and, and sort of actually would have rather had that life. Um, even in the face of, of the destruction. Uh, but, but to turn away from sin, um, or to, excuse me, to turn into sin, to look at it too hard, uh, usually sort of puts it further away from us. So when Christians talk about sin, uh, there's something we can take from this. We don't want to ignore it, like um, the, the people of Sodom ignored over and over again the word of the Lord that would warn them against this. We, we don't want to stare too hard at it like Lot's wife. Uh, we want to talk about it as if it's a real thing, um, even a common thing, but not a normal thing. Uh, for Christians, there's a difference between that which is common and that which is normal. Um, that which is common, you see everywhere. But that which is normal, normal is the way things are supposed to be. And see, the thing is, for, for you as a Christian, um, you are supposed to be normed by God's word and our confessions. You are actually supposed to be shown what is normal because God sp speaks and says, this is how things are supposed to be. And these things, these 10 things, these are not how things are supposed to be. You are not supposed to have other gods. You are not supposed to misuse my name. You are not supposed to forget the Sabbath. You are not supposed to uh, dishonor your parents. You are not supposed to murder or commit adultery in this case. Uh, those things are abnormal. They are not normal. If you want to see what normal looks like, don't look to what everybody else is doing. Look to what God says. This is how it's supposed to be. And so um, our, our book of Concord says we are normed by God's word and our confessions. We are made normal, um, even me. Uh, the world doesn't see this because they don't have a, a, a norming source. They don't have God's word to norm them, to make them normal. And so they look around and they say, well, if everybody's doing it, it must be how it's supposed to be. Well, we know things are not how they're supposed to be right here. Look around. The world fell when Adam sinned. Death, not normal, all too common. Sin. Not normal, all too common. We look to the world and recognize that, well, no, God wills that nobody dies. Uh, God wills that, that nobody should perish, but they would turn from their way and live. The only one that God wanted to die, the only normal death, was the death of Christ for you. The world isn't our source of figuring out what's normal, just what's common. So when we, when we talk about this, God wrote his law on our hearts. Yeah, we, we should recognize these things. Um, that, that as, as um, we, we deal in with uh, the law that is written on our hearts, we can actually start to see how things are supposed to be. But your conscience can be murdered. Like I, I, I am brought into this world with a conscience, with, with a, a, the shadow of God's law written on my heart. And I can actually see it, it'd probably be bad to go stabby stab every time somebody makes me mad. Uh, but at the same time, well, look to Sodom as actually a, a prime example of what happens when we, uh, when we murder our conscience. Um, it's not even just, you know, the, the grown men of, of the city that surround the house. It's even the young men. Uh, when you live in a culture and you lean into a culture that is um, so abrasive to that law written in your heart, you can either say, I'm going to be anxious and scared all the time, or you're going to start to lean into it. Um, 
serial killers can testify that you can erase the conscience. Stabby stab, uh, yeah. Um, and in the same way, you can rebuild your conscience. Uh, you, you can sharpen your conscience. Uh, because we know that God wrote his law on our hearts, but not the whole thing. It, it, because, well, sin breaks stuff, and Adam sinned. And, and so the law written on my heart is not the entirety of it. I can recognize, uh, thou shalt not stabby stab, but I am not born with a, a um, imprint on my heart uh, that we should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. That part actually has to be revealed to me from God's word, that I'm actually supposed to love and help my neighbor, and not just the neighbors that I like, but like all of them. We see this throughout the New Testament as Jesus uh, wrestles with uh, the scribes, the Pharisees, the lawyers. Who is my neighbor? In other words, who isn't my neighbor? As we are exposed to God's law, our consciences are, are sharpened. Um, as we flee from God's law, lean into sin, our consciences are, are, are murdered. I, I, you see it, uh, even do church attendance. Um, if you miss church uh, on Sunday, it feels weird. Um, even with the Rona, it, it feels weird. The problem starts to set in is after a while, it feels less weird. And so for the first few times that we had to do virtual church, we're like, this isn't the same. I want to sing with the saints. Um, a month in, I'm like, I ain't wearing pants. They can't see me. <laughs> Two months in, do you even care if you stream it? Sin breaks stuff, even your conscience, even your heart. Um, so when we then go to God's word, we look at the law so that our consciences would be built up, not just to keep us from gross and outward sin like is happening in Sodom, but so that we would never think that we're doing just fine on our own, so that we would never think, I don't need a Jesus who would die on the cross for sinners for this, for me. So that we would always say, Lord, without you, if you take your hand off this wheel for even a second, everything is going to fall apart. Um, instead, um, we want to go to a God who promises to help the sinners. Virtual church is like kissing through a screen door. It's interesting. So I'll just settle in on that image for a minute. <laughs> um, and then pick back up with another disturbing image. Um, as we deal with the fact that, that sin breaks stuff, I want to sort of go along this route. Let's, let's jump back into Lot's daughters. Sodom wasn't commend, uh, condemned because of adultery. Sodom was condemned because of unbelief. Because that sin that was sin was ignored over and over again until eventually the people wanted God to have nothing to do with it, let alone forgiveness. And if you don't believe me, like Luther would actually point out, there were adulterers who were spared, David being chief among them. Uh, David committed adultery, yet was spared by faith. Um, in the same way, Lot was also a sinner who was spared by faith. Recognize Lot sinned before he was saved by faith when he was brought out of the city. He sinned because he offered his own daughters to suffer sin. It, it is uh, not the order of creation that a father would send his daughters out to bear sin. It is not the order of creation that the man should send forth the women to bear the brunt of the damage that sin would work. It's the order of creation that the first would serve the last. It's the order of creation that the husband then, who is first, should suffer for and serve the one who came after, namely the wife. We sort of get this whole order of creation backwards because we say he who came last um, is, is, is uh, best, and then we stop when as soon as God creates women after men. <laughs> Oops. Um, in the order of creation, the first always serves the last. So God made plants to serve the animals. God made animals to serve the man. God made man to serve the woman. Lot sinned when he sent his daughters out to bear the damage that sin would do instead of bearing it for them. That's Still something he was forgiven for, though. Saved from. Lot was saved because God remembered Abraham. It was not his works. It wasn't even Abraham's works because we've been through uh, 19 chapters and we've already figured out that Abraham's a sinner too. But God made a covenant with sinners, with Abraham, with Lot, by a part of it, that he would be merciful to sinners. There are still consequences. Sin still breaks stuff. But at the same time, God is merciful to sinners. 
when we deal with the, the idea that um, sin would have consequence, recognize um, Lot runs to the hills above Zoar with his daughters who were brought through this night only by the grace of God, only by the angels who struck the men blind so they could not enter the house, only by the promise of God that they, leaving the city, would be kept safe, only by the promise and that God would even spare Zoar so that they can go and live there and still have a prosperous life, that life that Lot's wife turned away from. But instead, even after begging with God to spare the city of Zoar, Lot goes up to the hills. Lot went up to Zoar, but not into the city like he was supposed to. He lived into the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to live in Zoar. So he lived in a cave with his two daughters. Time out before the painful stuff. Lot was afraid to go to Zoar, even though God promised that he would keep that place safe. Sin breaks stuff. Zor was actually given as a shelter to keep God, or to keep Lot safe. But Lot was afraid because, well, God blew up that city. What if he's going to do it again? Even though he promised that he wouldn't. Fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is an unbelief of the promise. When Jesus says, don't be afraid, what he really means isn't just sort of shut off the fear switch. Shut off the anxiety switch. It's sin, yeah. It's a recognition. God, you are not a good gift giver. God, you are not somebody who I can trust. And so even though you have made me a promise, instead of focusing my mind, my imagination, my heart upon the promises that you have made, I'm going to think about the opposite. Because what if you're wrong? What if you're lying? And so Lot runs into the hills. Because I know God promised he wouldn't destroy Zoar, but what if he does it anyway? It happened again, uh, or it happened, excuse me, before. Um, after the flood, they try and build a tower in Babel, a tower that would go all the way up to heaven, a, a tower that, that might even be tall enough to withstand a flood that they remember. God promised he would never destroy the earth by water again, but the people sought a way to shelter, safety, apart from God's promise, apart from his command, and apart from, well, him, they tried to build up until they would be safe. Zor was supposed to be a shelter, but Lot is afraid to go to that. And instead he flees to the cave where he lives with his daughters, afraid all the time. And sin is infectious. Now, Lot's daughters have probably been some of the most abused in this whole section. Uh, so far, they have uh, been offered up to be raped. Uh, they have been taken away from a city promised to them and kept in a cave, um, kind of hostage-like, by a dad who's kind of, at this point in time, wild-eyed and scared of everything. Do you think that fear doesn't start to rub off on them? Do you think that sort of messed up sexuality won't kind of rub off on them? Lot exposes his daughters to sexuality in this way. They had not yet known a man. They were engaged. They had a family that was coming to them. But instead, their introduction to uh, uh, the gift uh, uh, of sexuality is, here, this angry crowd of many, many men go out there. Of course they have a sinful view of sexuality. Lot's daughters, afraid in the hills, that everything that God gives will be taken away because he is not merciful. It starts to, yeah, they did lose mom too. It, it starts to take over. And what if they're afraid then? that their family would end. As Lot's daughters get Lot drunk um, and take advantage of him, what we see is that infectious sin that never quite stays where we want it, spiraling out of control. The chapter will end um, that uh, both daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. And here's where I want to go, the Moabites, because there was somebody who was very important to us, Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. This union brought about Ruth, who we know 
was uh, the, the, the lineage of David, the adulterer, who we know was of the lineage of Christ, our Savior. This is, this is the line that Christ wants to enter his creation through, this one. The, the lineage that, that um, bore rape, the lineage that bore adultery, the lineage that bore incest. This is the way that Christ would come into the world. Um, no. But they were, however, the ones that Jesus saved. See, when Christ enters into creation through this particular lineage, he assumes these particular sins. The world wants to draw lines about us versus them, and sadly, the church has really kind of picked it up. And so we have, like, run-of-the-mill sins, like, you know, my sins, not your sins. Your sins are gross. Um, and, and then we have we have two little camps, the ones who are sort of sinners and the ones who are actually sinners. Christ came in through some of the most disturbing sin of the entirety of the scriptures. The chapter that Borchardt would leave me like this. He chose this lineage because he chose these sinners to redeem. He chose the, the broken ones who, who have been subjected to so much sin that they pass it on themselves. He, he chose it to the ones who by every single measurement of, of what is good in this world, uh, they, they are not nearly enough. But he comes through them to redeem us. And, and this is also the lineage then that, that he would also use to continue this promise. Um, Jesus sends preachers to sinners. <sighs> when Jesus sends out the 72... Understand who he's sending them to. He sends them out to, well, these. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And at hand, um, at hand means not far away. At hand means this close. The kingdom of God is near, here, right now. Because where God's word is proclaimed, there he is to help. When we deal with all of the sins of this world, all of the sins of, of here, well, we can deal then with the law in light of the gospel. So grab hold of 15 and 16 in Matthew chapter 10. I truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town that would not receive the preaching of the gospel, the town that would not let the peace of the promise of the kingdom of God rest upon it. Truly, it will be more bearable for the Sodomites who were rained upon by fire than the ones who will not hear the gospel. Because at the end of the day, the, the destruction of Sodom, it is a concrete example of what's already going on inside of all of us who are dying by the wages of sin. When Christ would promise to us that there would be sheep sent out even in the midst of wolves, that we would have life. Uh, when we talk about sin, we can recognize it breaks stuff. But this is the creation that God enters into to save the sinners inside of it. Um, the kingdom of God is where God's word is given, absolutely. And that means that when we live in a world that is, um, well, really intent on making fun of Sodom because of homosexuality and not wanting to hear that it is wrong, maybe start to understand why. To, to close the chapter, um, we sort of almost mock the idea of um, sodomy being called a sin. Uh, in today's society, not we as the church, but, but um, we who, who are, are living in, in the year 2020, um, because if we're actually going to deal with the law apart from the gospel, who of course could endure this? Who of course wouldn't mock it? But at the same time, we have a gospel sent to these kinds of sinners, a Jesus sent to these kinds of sinners, a church for these kinds of sinners, not that they would continue in their sin, not that, that, that um, they would uh, rejoice in it, not that they would be proud of their sin, but that they would find Jesus as an answer to it, a forgiveness for it, a life that, that would spare us from the death that that sin would bring. Um, Genesis 19 is uh, just a messed up chapter that I love uh, because as everything is falling apart bit by bit, you have angels walking into a, a city to, to um, be mugged and set upon by every uh, male of the city to do unspeakable things. We have uh, the man uh, of God sending out his daughters into that midst to try and save them. We have the whole city being uh, sent up in absolute fire. Uh, we have Lot's wife turning to salt for looking back. We have Lot hiding in the hills of Zoar with his daughters and then ultimately those daughters setting upon him in the same manner that he almost exposed them to a crowd. And in all of it, we have Moabites. We have Ruth. We have David. 
we have Jesus. Um, when we find Jesus coming to save these sinners, uh, then, then we can actually look at them and, and recognize that sin breaks stuff, so don't sin. Sin is bad. But Jesus saves sinners. Uh, I'm supposed to stop at about 45 minutes, I think. That's pretty good, right? All right. Uh, Y'all are back with Pastor Borghart tomorrow. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day. The Lord be with you.